No. One time no see. <clears throat> um, um, who are you? It's me, the book man. No clue. Th this is what we're doing. Hi, I'm the book man from Book of the Month, the monthly subscription book box service. But you already knew that. Mm -hmm. No. Each month we have a selection, anywhere from five to seven titles you can choose from. Where have you been? I've been combing through the best books for you. I waited for you. You're the one who skipped your subscription for a few months because you didn't want the books that we offered and now you've hopped back on because that's the service that we offer. Yeah, but I thought you'd still visit. What well, did you bring the books? Your cat just knocked over the camera and now it's at a completely different angle for continuity. Ugh, oh, other birds. I am so excited. I saw Mad I saw magical realism and I just you know me so well. I think you also ordered the new Allie Hazelwood romance. Love on the brain. Have you read this one? I don't read romance. It was so good. How much do I owe you? Do I get a discount? If you want, you can use the code EMMY to get your first box for $9.99. You know my card number. Uh, you should not give out that sensitive information. No, no, we're friends. I trust you. All right, well, I have other houses to get to today, so. What do you mean you have other deliveries? We're a business, that's my job. We're seeing other people? I'm just gonna go. I don't wanna see you again. Until next month. Next month. Yes, hello, welcome back. How are you doing? Today, I'm going to be telling you more. I'm gonna be revealing more what an English major reads. I have just finished technically my third year of English language and literature. For my third year, I was a part-time student. So in this video, I will be going over essentially everything I read for the three courses I took in my third year. And those courses were British literature. So a survey of British literature, but this course focused um, with a little sub theme on trauma. I looked at a lot of heavy, intense topics, a lot of trauma, exploring trauma and literature, what that does to literature itself, how can you even represent something that is by definition unknowable. I also took a course in Renaissance literature, so literature in the English Renaissance period. I believe the first piece we looked at was from 1510, 1515, all the way up until Paradise Lost, which was the last work we read for that class. And then this summer I just finished taking my American literature course, which was the bane of my existence, um, but this again was a survey course starting from the beginnings of America, what that means, all the way up until what was the last author we read? Toni Moore and more contemporary American authors. So I'm gonna take you through everything we read and then I'm just gonna try to explain in like one sentence, one or two sentences, what the heck this piece was and maybe one thing we studied with it. So let's get started. Historically, these videos are so long. If you hear Calcifer going crazy for a spring, he is obsessed with springs. They are his new favorite toy. We bought him a pack of like 10 and they're already all missing and he's down to one. Anyway. Let's just get started, welcome to the video. I have a list here, so I'm just gonna go in no particular order. I'm gonna mix and match books and works from different classes, so it's up to you to guess um, where they're from, although it should be fairly obvious. Okay, the first thing I have pulled here is Solar Bones by Mike McCormack. I freaking love this one. This is a piece of contemporary Irish literature. This was fantastic. This is about a man who dies. He's sitting at his kitchen table and his death brings about the ability for him to see the connection between all things, all systems, all peoples. Unfortunately, it is of course only death that has allowed him to see these things. This one we mostly talked about how solar bones brings death, which is kind of like a non-event for the person who has died and that you can't experience your own death, but of course solar bones. Our protagonist does experience his own death. What happens when you bring a person into like the after space of being and of death? What sort of ethical possibilities open up? This was great. I recommend this if you just want to read it. It is stream of consciousness though. I will warn you this whole book is one big sentence, so a um, little bit of a challenge to get through, but really worth it. Next one I have on my list is Impressions of an Indian Childhood by Zikala Sa. This one was talking about the Indian education policy in America, which was awful and brutal and which um, led to the attempt at assimilation. And essentially we looked at why it's called Impressions of a Childhood because the author wasn't really able to be there for their childhood. It was 
just an impression instead of like a firm concrete memory but also how the author is able to use education in order to condemn the way that they were educated. I also had to read uh, a bunch of Robert Frost poems most notably Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening which is my favorite and then um, The Road Not Taken among other things. Um, Robert Frost is, I feel like, an all-around solid poet to get through. I have a collection of his poetry somewhere on my shelf that my grandma gave me. I like his poetry. I don't really love analyzing it or talking about it. He's not one of those ones that I really want to go into depth into. We talked about how Robert Frost is just the quintessential rural farmer man. He's just like the rest of us. A novel that I honestly did not have the time to finish because it was for the summer course, which was sh smushed smushed into uh, <laughs> less weeks than you would like to have to finish all of the books that they smashed onto that course was Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. However, I did start this and the, the pages of the novel that I was able to get through blew me away. Fantastic. This is about our narrator who starts off the novel telling us he is invisible. Of course, this novel centers around race. Of course, I got to read all of the notes and I do know everything that happens in the book, but I will definitely be returning to this novel because um, the prose was just fantastic and I really, really want to read the rest of the story for myself. While we're at it, why don't I just admit to the rest of the works that I wasn't able to read, which were a few more. Um, the first one was The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Mostly, I didn't finish this one a second time around because it was a reread for me and I don't like the scarlet letter. This is the story of Hester who is branded with the scarlet letter A for adulteress or you know one of many meanings you could want it to mean um, and it's all about like who who's the father of her child? Who is he in this extreme Puritan town where she's obviously relegated to the kind of forest outcast exile region of the town and it's just about really controlling, domineering, um, strict Puritan ideals, but also how these ideals press so deeply that they lead to eruptions outside of these ideals and to people like Hester, her daughter Pearl, and eventually the um, person whose identity is the father to Pearl. I really can only take the Puritan um, discussion, Puritan ideas, Puritan books in small doses before I just get- it's why I cannot play um, the second Outlast game. I just- I can't. That terrifies me beyond belief and I think I just- these books terrify me. They honestly just terrify me. So, um, but besides that, I do find them a little bit dry. So, and the last person whose full work I did not get through was none other than Benjamin Franklin and his autobiography, because for the love of God, I could not do it. I could not get through this man's writing. He wrote like he had all the time in the world. He wrote like he was immortal, knowing that his writing would begrudge lit and history students for time to come that they would have to read word after word after word of him releasing not too much. I got, I think, 10 pages through his autobiography before I was like, Ben, can I call you Ben? I can't. What did we discuss though? He uses his autobiography as a manual for furthering human happiness. He constructs himself as the representative American, kind of like a spokesperson, and his narrative is kind of like a rags to riches type of story. We also looked at like the fulfillment of the American dream in his autobiography. Getting back to texts I did actually finish now, we have Endgame by Samuel Beckett. This was my third reread of this play, one of the best plays in the world. If you've not read Endgame, do it, but you're not gonna have a good time. Or you might have a good time, but you're probably not going to because it's Beckett. This is about four people trapped in a house and they can't leave. They cannot leave. The outside world is decimated by some sort of disaster where they're stuck. It's been reduced to zero and they cannot leave the house. We have um, Neg and Nell, who are the parents of Ham, who is kind of the tyrant of this house. His parents reside in the garbage cans. My professor for this class was actually a Beckett scholar, so we got so many good lectures about this, but what do I want to say? There's a quote I wrote down that says, the boredom of living replaced by the suffering of being. It's a fun time. This is an extremely anxious, fearful um, play about death and disability and what happens when you think you can't go on existing but you do anyway because you just, you have to. What kind of happens to you when you're stuck in this place? Do you tell stories? Do you just sit down and wait for the end of the world? The short story I had to read is Mrs. Spring Fragrance by Suisun Farr. This was really good. This one, we talked about the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which prohibited a lot of Chinese immigration, especially for laborers. 
So the story is pretty much a critique of the discriminatory conditions that constrained a whole bunch of Chinatown communities. And in this one, we follow Mrs. Spring Fragrance, who's playing a little bit of a matchmaker part, but it's also about the intimacy that is able to take place between different families, but then also contrasting that with the lack of intimacy that is able to take place in the Chinese communities because families are just getting separated over and over again and they can't be together. I read Sylvia Plath. She was one of the authors I chose to write uh, one of my papers on in my American Lit course. So we read Lady Lazarus, um, Ariel, and a bunch more of her poems, but I just, I love her so much. I wrote my essay on Lady Lazarus and in that one I talked about the desire in the poem for female existence that is untethered to the female body and the struggle um, reconciliation if that's possible between female identity and the female body which is a huge struggle when um, a lot of your identity and a lot of your being is pretty much dictated to you through your body. Um, the essay meant so much to me especially with like what was happening at the time I was writing it. Next, we also read Phyllis Wheatley, a couple of her poems. I can't remember which ones exactly. If you don't know, Phyllis Wheatley was the first, uh, in 1773, she became the first published African-American writer. And then we also talked about how at the time, a lot of the <laughs> values that are in her poetry um, that stem from the classical tradition later became super important in revolutionary discourse. I wrote my second essay in the American Lit course on Emily Dickinson and two of her poems, but we read so many Emily Dickinson poems for um, this class and I hadn't really, I had some ex exposure to Emily Dickinson, but after reading the ones that we did, like I just fell in love with her. I had never been a huge Dickinson fan, probably because I just simply hadn't read very much of her, but <sighs> Emily Dickinson. Emily Dickinson. I am so glad that I have this copy of her collected poems because I cannot wait to read it. The ones that I wrote my essay on were You Said That I Was Great and I Think I Was Enchanted. We also read Howl by Allen Ginsberg, which is a sensational, phenomenal poem. He is part of the Beat Generation um, and Howl, if you haven't read it, highly recommend. Highly recommend. Actually, I highly recommend you listen to his reading of it on YouTube or somewhere, but we read Howl. We also read um, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. This one was a reread for me. And then we also read Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs. So this one is the bind up of the two. I got to write, I got to write on both of them in my final exam. Both of these chronicle their lives, born into slavery. This is the modern classics edition. This one is phenomenal. It also comes with a bunch of notes. So I would highly recommend this one. We read King Lear by Shakespeare. This is, oh god, it hurts. This one hurts. King Lear hurts in a way that is different to like Romeo and Juliet pain or um, really any other kind of Shakespeare pain I can think of. It just leaves you like blank staring off into the distance, vacated. You vacated your own body reading King Lear. Um, this one was insane. This one, we somehow spent a lot of lectures talking about the idea of nothing, the word nothing. And like the idea of nothingness crops up so much in King Lear. This is about King Lear who has three daughters. He decides he's going to separate his kingdom into three pieces for each of them, which is crazy. Like no one would, no one would ever do that. The king's body cannot escape from the body of the land. So he's essentially mutilating himself. It's about kind of the madness that he descends into. We discussed mostly the idea that like, what do you do when your identity isn't confirmed by those around you and when you feel like you're just literally slipping away from yourself when you don't have people to confirm your role or when you do become too attached to your role that you replace it as your identity and what do you do when you discover that maybe there's literally nothing at the heart of you maybe you are literally just nothing like who are you those classes were intense we also read Thomas Jefferson's The Declaration of Independence. Yep. Also by, what's his face? Nathaniel Hawthorne. We read My Kinsman Major Molyneux. Um, this was just okay. This is a short story about a guy who arrives in America looking for his kinsman, who he's like, I was promised kind of a better life here. Um, what's going on? And he finds that the America he arrives in is very dark. There's a lot of dark energies running under the surface and um, kind of what happens when he does find his kinsman. Beloved by Toni Morrison. I have already, I had already read this once. Five stars. This is, this might have been my favorite thing on the whole entire syllabus. Um, this book is so good. 
Um, for me, Toni Morrison, reading this the first time, this was kind of one of the most challenging reading experiences I've had in a while. I think she is so outlandishly talented. This is the story of a woman named Setha who um, is also split between a couple timelines, but she escapes from slavery and Setha has a daughter named Beloved who comes back to her as a ghost and haunts their home. This is also loosely a reimagining of a real life woman, I forget her name, um, that Toni Morrison decided to um, become inspired by and write Beloved. So this is like literally fantastic. I think if there's maybe one or two different books I could recommend in this whole video, it would be Beloved. We had to read um, Bartleby the Scrivener by, <laughs> by Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Mm, which was kind of just about the anxieties, the contrasting anxieties between um, self-definition and social definition. And also, what happens when you live in a market society? The Wolf of Wall Street. We read The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, short story, you've probably heard of it. And if you haven't read it, read it. It's about a woman uh, trapped in a house in a room and she sees other women in the wallpaper. So good. Smushing them together, we read Thoreau and Emerson. We read um, Civil Disobedience. We also read uh, Self-Reliance and Nature by Emerson. These are like essays all about um, renewing yourself. Renew yourself. Go out in nature. Um, be who you want to be, Barbie girl. And Emerson is like, if the government in place is not serving you, you can serve the government. Serve them a lawsuit, kick them out, like that's your duty um, as a citizen. I also got to read Memorial by Alice Oswald, which is a version of Homer's Iliad. So what Memorial does, this is a retelling, reimagining of the Iliad, is that it does away with all of the characters and plot points in the Iliad and it focuses solely on um, the names of every single person who died in the Iliad in the Trojan War as well as attending to the atmosphere and the colors and perceptions and um, environment of the Iliad. It is so, so, so powerful um, and like it suggests it is a memorial for all the people who died. I had to read Utopia by Thomas More, which is like a little satire on the idealized society, but also um, its goal is mainly to start a dialogue about how do you go about constructing a society, bettering a society, uh, what is the place of philosophers in society, the debate between kind of the philosopher king or the king, the king who is a philosopher. Um, this was just okay. It was just okay. It is about a fake island called utopia um, where people live and they have like the perfect life but of course it invites the reader to critique all the things about their society for themselves. We read Richard Lovelace who is another poet. Um, I will try my best to remember for you whether some of these Renaissance poets, what side they are in in the English Civil War because it, it, it we'll see. If I make a mistake, I'm sorry. Um, whether they are cavalier poets, I believe Lovelace was because he did fight in the war. I'm not sure if he was on the side of Parliament or the King. Going back way before Richard Lovelace, we read Sir Thomas Wyatt, who wrote some of the first sonnets in the English language. If you don't know essentially what happened is that we have Petrarch, who is an Italian poet who wrote so many sonnets. Kind of how English sonnets came to be was that literally people like Wyatt would just translate or make their own English versions of Petrarch's poems. So it was just kind of like copy paste and then eventually from there it grew into its own thing because English, English sucked if you didn't know. No one liked English in the Renaissance period. If you spoke English that was like not very cool. You better speak Latin, you better speak Italian, you better speak French. Uh, prose writing did not exist. Everyone thought that was hot garbage and so um, even writing or beginning to write poetry in English was quite a big thing and that is what Sir Thomas Wyatt did So we read stuff like they flee from me who so list to hunt a lot of the early Renaissance English poets were prominent court figures and um, he got in a bit of hot water for Maybe possibly having a relationship with Anne Boleyn um, It's speculated that a lot of the poems he wrote like who so list to hunt um, As well as the one where he talks about her execution were about her. So that is Sir Thomas Wyatt it, I really actually enjoyed um, the early early pieces in the Renaissance like around King Henry VIII his reign and the, the poetry that was kind of 
being discussed there I thought that was kind of fun because it was all like intrigue and people just getting beheaded and it was just kind of fun We also read Kate Chopin's The Story of an Hour. This is really cool This is about a woman who learns that her husband has been killed in an accident and everyone is like, oh my gosh She's so upset, but then she goes up into her private bedroom and she's like He's dead. I'm so free. I can finally live my own life and not exist just for him. Um, and it is all about the suffocating life of being a woman in this period of domestic life. Um, but it also plays on the genre of the short story, which is itself very short and suffocating and it plays on the confines of the house, um, different rooms in the house, like what they're used for, what you can express in different rooms and it was really cool and there's a huge reversal of fortune at the end of the short story too, which I'm not gonna spoil, but um, I would recommend, it's super short. We got to read T.S. Eliot, we read both his essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent, which is basically like, what do you wanna do? If you wanna be a good poet, you have to read literally everything. <laughs> you have to read everything that came before you and then you have to kind of fit yourself into the tradition while also trying to emerge as your own individual writer. And then we also read a few of his poems. We read the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which is about an extremely anxious man who does not want to be perceived, who does not want to have human interaction, and I'm honestly relating so much to the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock right now. It's the one that ends like, um, we have lingered we have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. That's the one. Um, gorgeous. We got to read Andrew Marvell, who writes like devotional poetry to God. He also writes about like the conflict of himself and God. We read The Book of the Courtier by Castiglione. This is about um, how do you be a good courtier? How do you live in your little um, castle and how do you like, you know, advise the king? How do you like um, just be like cool and easy breezy beautiful um, How do you strike a balance between like being quite aloof and smart and breezy? It was fine And then it also goes on this huge long rant about like love and what love is so It's just like a manual of instruction basically I read Richard Crashaw who wrote the flaming heart the poetry. I have nothing to say about this man. I'm so sorry. We read Yeats. We read um, Leda and the Swan. We also read Auden's poems, um, the, <laughs> the Song of Achilles, The Shield of Achilles. We also got to read some pieces of poetry by Henry Howard. Once again, nothing to say about this man. A lot of the Renaissance people just left me with nothing. We got to read Seamus Heaney. This is my first time reading Seamus Heaney. We read a bunch of his poems, like Digging, um, punishment. Punishment is probably the best one. He has such a cool concern with archaeology and like history, physical history, um, memory, and it was so good. So fascinating. Like Seamus Heaney was probably one of the coolest people I got introduced to in my third year. I loved loved his work so much and I cannot wait to read more. We also got to read poetry by Mary Sidney and her brother Sir Philip Sidney who is super famous and is credited the most with introducing the sonnet sequence um, into English language. He wrote Asterfell and Stella which is a beautiful sonnet sequence of 118 sonnets and it's all about his love for Stella. It was his love for this woman named Penelope who like he was pining after, she married someone else, you know the deal. 118 sonnets represent the 118 suitors that um, the other Penelope has in the Odyssey that Odysseus has to fight off and it's all about unrequited love but it is actually so gorgeous that I did not mind the at times like whiny tone that a lot of these poems carry across. This is one of my favorite pieces that we read in Renaissance. And then Mary Sidney, who is like the lesser known figure, she is his sister and she also wrote sonnets as well. I got to read Daisy Miller by Henry James. I was so excited to try another Henry James after reading The Turn of the Screw, which is one of my favorite books of all time. Daisy Miller is completely different because it is about the clash between two different classes of American people duking it out um, at like a watering hole or a resort abroad. So in this case, Italy and Switzerland. Daisy, who is part of like the I don't really want to call it new money, but I guess new money. And she meets this man named Winterborn, who is of course symbolic of the like older, more stuck up um, American class who doesn't discuss like anything. They're very cloistered and protected and live their life very shut up and it's about their meeting. It is a tragedy as well. And I, I actually really enjoyed it. Although it was very like, read this for an English lit kind of book, if that makes sense. We read so much John Donne that it was kind of crazy. We read A Nocturnal Upon St. Lucy's Day. We read stuff like Satire 3. We read Batter My Heart. We read Forbidden Morning. 
Um, we read so many works from Dunn. I love him, but he does get a little bit tiresome after a while. My favorites were probably A Nocturnal Upon St. Lucy's Day. That one was really fun. Smith, who's Smith? Oh God. We read John Smith and John Winthrop, who were both like early American writers writing about how great America was, making people want to come over, trying to get people from Europe and like UK to come to America and he was painting it as like such a great place but in reality he was also like getting paid for getting people to come to America so we kind of looked at the utopian visions that were presented in both John's work. We read Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain which is probably one of my least favorite works we read um, in my third year overall. I just really did not like this. I do not think I get along with Mark Twain. This is my first Mark Twain but I just had such a rough time reading this but I did get through it. We read Volpone by Ben Johnson which is a play about greed and money and um, fortune chasers who are basically like little people like vultures. Valpone has a lot of animal imagery and animal symbolism. People who would hang around someone who is dying and wait to inherit their fortune. So it's kind of about the relationship between Valpone who is also like the trickster fox figure because he's trying to trick everyone into believing that he is dying so that people come and like do favors for him, give him money so that they hope they'll be included in his will. We read um, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell by William Blake. This was reread for me. This is a very strange, this is a very strange one to parse and to study. It's all about, um, it's all about the harmony between contradictions and it's also like Blake's rage at society and the church for demonizing so many things that really have no business being demonized. We read Keats' Ode to a Nightingale I want to cry every time I think about that poem. Really quickly, we read Anne Bradstreet's Henry King. I think it's Henry King. Henry King and Thomas Carew. Is it Thomas Carew? Um, we also read Robert Herrick. We also read John Zenham. And we also read Mary Rowlandson. We read Beowulf, which was fantastic. I love Beowulf, not the character. Um, I love, I love Grendel. I love Grendel. My first dog, their name is going to be Grendel. This is a spoiler, but I'm gonna name my dog Grendel. I love, I love Beowulf. I love Grendel, love it. We of course read Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. I wrote, I think the best thing I've ever written was my essay on Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, which looked at like um, witnessing or essentially breaking down the different components that make up Frankenstein's creature from animal parts to human parts to bones and history that have been buried and unearthed and then re-amalgamated into a person but looking at what the gaze of the creature does to Victor when it's broken down into the material components like where they're sourced from and then talking about just the act of witnessing, the act of being witnessed by someone else. Probably the thing I'm most proud of in my whole university life up to date so that was really cool. Um, I just, yeah, Frankenstein amazing. I read the entirety, I read the entirety of Paradise Lost this year. It was so worth it. Um, I had such a phenomenal time with this. Of course, I've read sections and stuff for other classes, but I've never sat down and read it cover to cover, and I had the chance to do this in my third year, and it was so great. This is John Milton's reimagining or breaking down a few verses of Genesis into a whole epic poem about Humanity's Fall from Eden. Really briefly, because my throat is giving out, we read Tennyson, we read Robert Browning, My Last Duchess, and we also read Letters from an American Farmer. That sounds exciting. The last thing I have here is Big Boy, and that is The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. I also wrote an essay about this one and the different women monsters in book one, two, four of The Fairy Queen. We didn't read this whole thing, thank God. This is again a huge poem about different knights and the virtues that they exemplify and the adventures that they have to go on in order to really embody these virtues. So the first book follows Red Cross Knight who embodies, who embodies faith or holiness and um, yeah. I thought I was gonna hate The Fairy Queen, but I actually really grew to love it. So that is, that is everything I can tell you that I read for my third year. I'm probably missing some things, honestly. That is like the bulk of what I read for my third year. So this video has gone on for so long. I do have a bunch of others like this if you want to see everything else that I've read so far for my English degree, but I am so excited to finally be so close to finishing my lit degree. I have one more class to take and then I will have graduated. Third year was definitely weird, a little bit of a mixed bag, but I also read and got to write some stuff that um, 
means a lot to me so thank you so much for watching if you got all the way to the end of this video leave like leave a stack of books till my next video thank you so much stay well and i will see you then ciao look i'm sorry maybe we can i just looked at you <laughs>